Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, parents. Welcome to Millennium High School's Athletics Fall Sports Parent Meeting. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video to receive some valuable information and make sure your son or daughter's fall season is a success. Uh, first, let me congratulate you on your son or daughter making one of our fall sports teams. We're very fortunate to have some of the best athletic programs in the state, so them making a team is no small feat. Congratulations to them as well as to your entire family. Uh, my name is Mr. Gordillo, or Mr. G. I am Assistant Principal Athletic Director here at Millennium High School. This is my ninth year at Millennium High School, the eighth as the Athletic Director, and I was also an Athletic Director at another high school in the West Valley prior to coming to Millennium. I think I'm on year 13 or 14 as an Athletic Director. I'm very excited to be back here at Millennium High School and working with um, all of the other Tigers. Uh, I look forward to seeing them compete this season and again look forward to meeting or seeing you at the games. I want to begin uh, with this video by introducing our athletic trainers. We're very fortunate to have two awesome athletic trainers here at Millennium High School. Both are back at Millennium High School for their second year, so we're fortunate to have them again and continue on with the consistency um, that they began with last year. Um, our first athletic trainer is Miss Cassie Barlow. She's also a sports medicine teacher here with us. Um, and then in the afternoons and evenings, she's our athletic trainer working with our, all of our programs. Uh, Miss Carly Walkup is an uh, athletic trainer. She is a full-time athletic trainer, so she does not teach with us. Um, she contracts through us through Banner, but her entire job and assignment is Millennium High School. Um, so welcome them back when you see them. I'm sure they'll be happy to see a friendly face and a smile. Um, rather than me talking about them and all of the rules and procedures um, that they have, um, we will share a video with you where they'll introduce themselves and talk about some important information. I would encourage you to listen closely. We obviously want all of our Tigers to be healthy this season, but the reality is, is uh, in athletic injuries do happen, and we want to make sure that we get them healed and cleared as fast as possible. We also want you to be aware of our safety protocols and um, how diligent they are about adhering to our safety protocols to keep your sons and daughters safe. Hi, parents. I just wanted to give a quick introduction. My name is Carly Walkup. I am Cassie Barlow. Um, we are both athletic trainers here for Millennium High School. Wanted to give you a quick uh, brief introduction about what we do, what we're here for, how to use us. Um, so for those of you that don't know, Cassie and I are both licensed healthcare professionals. Uh, we're here for the safety and protection of your athletes. Um, you can use us for uh, injury assessments, evaluations, rehabilitation. Um, we're here every day after school treatment times um, go for about an hour after school and we're here through the duration of whatever athletic events are going on at that day. Um, and just a quick brief uh, snippet into the <laughs> into our relationship. Uh, my full-time position is contracted through Banner Sports Medicine. Um, so we have kind of a really good connection with some team doctors. We have specialties like orthopedic, sports, uh, other sports medicines, uh, primary cares, physical therapists that work specifically with our school. Um, so if we ever need to branch out into the community, we have those resources that we can help you with. And then my role is much more of like an assisting, supporting role um, in the athletic training room. I teach sports medicine all day here on campus, and then I assist Carly in um, the athletic training room after school. So that's why it's so important that when your athlete does need to be evaluated, rehabbed, or treated, that they get in here right after school. Um, we prefer them to be in here by 2.30, 3 o'clock at the latest so that we can ensure that they are getting the treatment that they need and still get out to practice at a timely manner. So if you know that your athlete needs to come see us, please make sure that they're coming in during those treatment times. Um, and we want to be obviously available in there for every athlete that's on our campus. Um, we do realize that there are some athletes with specific conditions, um, whether that be allergies, diabetes, um, any other um, seizures or any other medical conditions that may apply. We just ask that after you watch this video, if this applies to you, just reach out to both of us um, and, and just fill us in so that way should an event occur where we need to provide care for your athlete um, and regarding their specific condition, we're aware of it and uh, it just helps our, make, our, make our job a little easier. In conjunction with watching this video, you guys should also have access to a parent handout um, that we have provided to you. Um, the information that is on that form specifically talks about medical clearance 
um, for your athlete in case that they suffer from an injury or they do go to the doctor. So please make sure that you're referencing that um, handout, you're looking over it. And basically a good rule of thumb is, is that your athlete goes and sees a doctor for whatever reason, please make sure that you get clearance documentation and that you provide that documentation to us. So this allows us to seamlessly allow them back into participation. And that way we're not chasing down um, doctor's notes. We're not having to call you guys at home um, and uh, your athletes not missing time in practice or games. So obviously our best interests um, or our, our best interests are for your children's best interests, right? We want everybody to be safe um, and protected at all times. And should an injury arise, we need time to do our job. We know mom and dad want to jump on the sideline, come down there and see what's going on. Um, you know, that actually interrupts our, our, our care process. And we just ask you, just take a minute, take a deep breath, let us do our job. And when we're ready to loop parents in, we'll, we'll do so. Absolutely. Uh, so with that too, just so you guys know that when your athlete is on campus, especially for the fall, um, we do have heat um, policy procedures in place. Um, every day we get a reading of the heat index and we have AIA guidelines that allows us to prohibit or restrict certain types of participation for that time. And so um, one thing that you guys can do at home to help your athlete be safe is every single day send them to campus with a jug of water or at least have a jug handy that they can fill once they get to um, practice uh, and also drinking it through throughout the day so that they're ready to go. Another little key fact that they can do is have a snack available for them that they can eat real quick after school and it just allows for their bodies to be more prepared um, to be healthy during practices. Along with the, the key um, resources that we have, we also have two um, new, res uh, not new, but two concussion resources that we utilize here. Um, so we have our impact and um, testing and our sway, which is the new one that we're implementing this year. Um, and we just wanted to briefly touch on these. So if we ever give you a phone call, say, hey, you know, impact, your kid did impact today, your kid is on sway today. Um, we just wanted to give you a heads up on what these resources were. So basically we take a baseline reading at the beginning of the year for all of our contact athletes. We get their basic brain functioning is what we're doing. So should a head injury ever occur, we, we refer back to those baseline tests and we test them again to make sure that our brain is functioning normally, our response time is working, our motor control is working just the same as it was before the injury occurred, uh, which allows for a safer transition back into sport. Um, I just wanted to give you a quick uh, background on those so if we ever reach out, you know what we're talking about. We're here to utilize as a resource for you because ultimately our goal is to make sure that your athletes stay safe and that you guys stay well informed. So have a safe season and we hopefully won't talk to you soon. <laughs> Go Tigers! Thank you. Uh, Carly and Cassie. Um, I just wanted uh, to get... go next slide. Sorry I'm about curious. that. I um, just wanted to give a quick introduction. My name is Carly Walkup. I am Cassie Barlow. Um, we are both at Athletic Training. There we go. All right. Thank you, Cassie and Carly. Uh, again, if you have questions, please email them on the emails that were earlier in the video. Sorry for that technical glitch right there. Uh, the next thing we want to talk about is academic eligibility. Um, we believe that our student athletes, student comes before athlete for a reason. They have to be a successful student in order to be uh, a successful athlete. And without being a successful student, they were not going to have the opportunity to be uh, an athlete. So there are two parts to our academic eligibility part. The first part is the credits earned. Um, so freshmen, as you can see there, they do not have to earn any credits in order to be eligible to compete. The reason for that is that they have not had the opportunity to take classes to earn credits. Uh, sophomores must have earned at least four credits prior to being able to be eligible to participate. Juniors must have earned at least 10 credits prior to being um, eligible to participate. And seniors must have earned at least 16 credits in order to be eligible. Uh, students that are deficient in credits earned for their grade level are academically ineligible uh, to compete. So if you're a sophomore and they have three credits, then they do not meet the requirement to be academically eligible to compete, and they would not be able to compete until they have uh, received four credits. So the credits have to be earned and completed prior to whatever uh, sport or season it is that they play. And 
so the numbers are, are not just arbitrary numbers that were picked out of a hat. Uh, the numbers that you see there, the earned credits, that's how many credits they have to have earned to be in, on track to graduate on time. So it, obviously we love having your student athletes here and we love all our Tigers, but the ultimate goal is to get them here, uh, educate them and then have them graduate and move on to the next phase of their life. So these credits earned um, is what shows that they're on track to graduate on time. Now, if uh, your student athlete is uh, credit deficient, and academically ineligible as a result. They can apply for a one-time waiver. Uh, but again, that can only be used one time during their four years here at Millennium High School. Um, the way that would work is uh, they would they would meet with their counselor, they would complete the waiver application, uh, which includes their plan to get back on track, and the principal would review that and ultimately would make a decision on whether to approve the waiver or not. That is, uh, again, at the principal's discretion, and it can only be used one time in their four years. So if it's already been used, then uh, they don't have the opportunity to do that again. So how do we know if they have credits earned? So each roster is uh, given to me once rosters are complete, and I check every student athlete, uh, their credits earned. Uh, that process actually is beginning today because a lot of teams have already uh, made their cuts. Once it's complete, your student athlete would be notified as well as yourself if they are credit deficient, as well as what the process is from there. The second part of our academic eligibility policy, uh, it's very important. That, uh, you, that we are tuned in, locked into this, because this is different. So if you've been here before, um, you're used to the previous academic eligibility policy. There is a key change or two key changes to it this year. So now we will only check grades for eligibility purposes uh, every nine weeks. So when report cards come out, so first quarter report card, semester report card, third quarter report card, um, and then obviously the end of the semester would not matter. But so it's on a nine week interval. So they have nine weeks to be passing. Um, if they are failing a, a, a class, then they become ineligible at the end of that grading period. Uh, but there is a little bit of a change. If the grading period falls, um, you know, if there's a break following when report cards come out, which there always is. So the end of uh, the first quarter here, the Friday before uh, the, that Friday, the next week is fall break. So their ineligibility period would not start until that Saturday of fall break. Okay. And then it would be one week. So it is a mandatory one week sitting period. So they can become ineligible on Saturday. We recheck their grades the next Friday. And if they are uh, passing all their classes at that time, then they become eligible again on that Saturday. Um, if your student athlete does become academically ineligible, you will be notified as well as your student athlete um, and their counselor via email. In that email, it will explain the date that they become, uh, that the ineligibility starts, as well as when we recheck again and when is the soonest that they be can become eligible. Um, so it is still one week. The difference is when it starts. Um, why did we make that change? Well, the reason for the change was uh, if it was a break, the grades came out on Friday and then we're on break. Obviously, teachers aren't working. Student athletes don't have the opportunity during that break to work on any work, do any assignments, take any reassessments to get their grade back up. And so they're effectively being penalized. Um, even longer because they don't have the opportunity to get that grade up. So that is the reason for the change. So again, when the grades come out, um, when fall break hits, uh, they're still eligible during fall break until that Saturday, and then they would become ineligible at that point. And then if a student athlete is still failing once we recheck their grades, after that first check, it becomes their responsibility to notify myself once they've, uh, uh, they're have they passing again so that I can verify and then deem them eligible to return to competition. So just to recap real quick, Every nine weeks, so the end of each quarter is a grading period that determines student athletes' academic eligibility. Uh, if they're passing all their classes, they're fine. If they're failing, they become ineligible for one week, which starts at the end of a break. Okay. Um, if you have questions on that, please feel free to email me, contact me. Uh, We'll tell you this, the coaches have a coach's corner where they can see every day, it's updated every 24 hours, it'll tell them what the student athlete's grades 
are in all of their classes. Um, it will also tell them the students' uh, absences, students' tardies. So they have all that information. They are, are they're wa- watching it, monitoring it. You as a parent have parent view where you can also see the exact same information. You can see um, what their grade is in the class uh, in terms of teacher's grade book. You can see their absences. You can see their tardies. Um, so I would encourage you to monitor that, work with them. Um, so that way, the more of us that are monitoring, we can help make sure that they stay eligible. Uh, next Participation fee. Um, Our district does have an athletic participation fee for all student athletes. It is a $100 participation fee. Um, If your son or daughter uh, qualifies for free or reduced lunch, it is a $50 participation fee. The participation fee is due before the first game. If students um, do not pay the fee before the first game, then they're not able to play or participate, compete until that fee is paid. So they are cleared to practice, um, but before that first game, that fee is due in order for them to be paid. Uh, we keep coaches up to date on on um, you know who has paid. So as we get closer, you know nobody uh, slips through the cracks and, and has to miss a game uh, because we weren't there. So how do you know how to pay the participation fee? Uh, you'll receive an email from our bookstore that your son or daughter is on a team, what the cost of participation fee is, and then it lists the instructions on how you can pay online, as well as they can um, you could come in person to the bookstore to pay in person or send your son or daughter with the money to pay in person. Um, If you have any questions on the participation fee, feel free to to reach out to me. Some of you have already received that email and some of you will be receiving it soon uh, once we get the roster from your coach and the roster is finalized. Uh, So uh, that covers the participation fee. Uh, transportation. Transportation is always a, a, a hot topic. Um, so I, w- I want to state this. Uh, it, all students are required to ride to and from all school uh, events on school provided transportation. So your son or daughter is required to ride um, the school bus or whatever the transportation that we provide is to their uh, to their game or event and also back. Okay, Um, so no, you can't just pick them up at a game and take them home or say, hey, I'm going to drop them off uh, and then move on. Why is that? Well, we're liable for them. We're responsible for them. We want to make sure they get there on time. But also um, it is it is a safety piece to make sure all our student athletes are accounted for and our coaches know where everybody's at. So if you have an emergency situation extenuating circumstance, you can contact me. Um, Emergency situation, extenuating circumstance is not, hey, it's um, Johnny's birthday and we want to take him to dinner right after the game. Unfortunately, that's not an emergency circumstance or an extenuating circumstance. Um, So uh, things like that aren't. If a student athlete's injured in competition and you need to take them to the doctor uh, right away, that's a situation that, you know, we're not going to say, hey, you have to sit here with a broken leg and ride the bus back. Um, so that's an example of an emergency situation or extenuating circumstance where you would you can transport them right away, um, and the coach would notify me that that is happening. Okay. Uh, attendance policy. So students uh, must attend at least half of their classes. Um, in order to be eligible to practice or play in games, all right? So if a student has a full schedule of six classes, then they have to be there for at least half of them, half the day, in order to be eligible to participate in practice or play in games. If not, then they're not eligible to participate. Again, I just mentioned earlier the coaches' corner where coaches can see what the, um, you know, their, their attendance, if they're there that day, Uh, and then ultimately your son or daughter may not be able to practice if they're not there half the day. Uh, Again, if there's extenuating circumstances, please contact me. So, for example, if they have um, a dentist appointment, orthodontist appointment, doctor's appointment, things like that that are going to cause them to miss, um, you know, a significant part of the day, then you would contact me with that information so that we can allow them to um, practice or play, whichever scenario it is. Obviously, if there's a, a funeral uh, that causes your son or daughter to miss the day, um, we're not going to tell them, hey, you can't practice or play if they they come at that time because of that. But the key is communication. So communicate with me if there are extenuating circumstances so that we can make sure that your son or daughter is not penalized when they are, but also that we're in compliance with our, our school district policy. 
Code of Conduct. So when you guys do register my athlete, I know there's a bunch of different documents and you're signing and sometimes we're trying to rush because we're like, I got to meet this deadline so my son or daughter can try out or so they can participate in the summer. We'd always read through it with the, um, you know, in detail. So in the register my athlete, there is an athletic code of conduct. It's a district athletic code of conduct that states what the expectations are in terms of student behavior, um, as well as what the consequences are if uh, they violate that and they have a code of conduct violation. I would encourage you to go back into there and read through that with your son or daughter so both of you understand what the expectations are at Millennium High School and as well as what um, you know what the consequences could be if the expectation is not met. Um, I believe that everybody here at this school um, are awesome people and we have some awesome students, but we also, uh, um, as teenagers, they're still growing, they're still developing, they're still learning, and sometimes they may not make the best decision. Um, and if so, then we will, we will work through that. Um, but it's important that they're aware of what those expectations are and what the consequences could be um, in, in hopes that that will allow them to make a better decision. Um, there are certain infractions that will lead to dismissal uh, for the rest of the season for that student athlete. You know, possession of drugs, um, under the influence of drugs, alcohol, um, those would lead to, to dismissals from a team. Fighting, um, assaults, you know, acts of physical aggression, those would lead to um, somebody being removed for the remainder of the season. You know, why would we remove them? You know, people say, oh, well, they need sports. That's what keeps them out of trouble. Well, if somebody's, you know, possession of, of drugs or alcohol or under the influence of those, um, we, you know, that could expose other students who may not be otherwise exposed to it. That also, you know, could be on another campus. And now we have a coach who's dealing with, a, you know, a situation with another school that they're not familiar with, the administration team, as well as their law enforcement of that team. Um, and being under the influence, you know, during a game or during a practice is, is dangerous to that student athlete's health as well as others. You know, acts of physical aggression. You know, sports are competitive. People get competitive. Um, you know, they want to be successful. They want to win. There's already that going. If somebody demonstrates that they can't restrain themselves physically, um, then we run the risk of putting them in an already competitive environment. How can we say that they wouldn't be able to restrain themselves in that type of environment? So those are examples. Um, but the key piece here is to read through the uh, code of conduct with your son or daughter to make sure that everybody's aware of expectations. Um, how does the process work if there's a violation of code of conduct? Um, if there's a violation of code of conduct and there's school discipline, uh, applied school discipline would supersede the code of conduct violation. So what I mean by that is, let's say somebody um, you know was in a fight, whatever the school discipline is for that, once that is over, then we would move to the code of conduct part. So the code of conduct, um, uh, if there's a code of conduct violation, what happens is a meeting has to be set with uh, myself as the athletic director, the head coach of the program, the student athlete, and um, parents and or guardian. Uh, we would all meet, uh, we would discuss the situation, allow student athlete to um, give their version of the events. We, uh, you know, we would interview the student athlete. Everyone in that meeting would have an opportunity to speak. And then ultimately, uh, at the conclusion of that, uh, we would uh, review all of the information and a decision would be made on how the code of conduct is applied in that situation. And then you would be informed via email, your, your son or daughter, as well as uh, yourselves, on what the outcome of that uh, code of conduct is. Hopefully, we don't have any code of conduct violations and um, you know, we never have to have any of those meetings. That's always my goal. And I think being aware of those expectations and reviewing those can help with that. Um, transfers. Some uh, some people watching this video, your son or daughter may have transferred from another high school here. I want to make sure that you're aware of the transfer policies. These are not Millennium High School's transfer policies. These are the AIA's transfer policies, which were responsible uh, we're responsible for um, enforcing. Okay, so if a student's attend another high school prior to enrolling at Millennium High School, they're considered a transfer student, whether that's out of state, whether that's in state. Okay, transfers have to complete a 550 form. Um, some of you watching this, your son or daughter has already done that. That form is online. It's on AIAonline.org. Again, AIAonline.org. You would go and you would complete that. That's the first step that has to be completed before we can determine if a student is eligible to play for us as a transfer. Uh, first time transfer, so if a student athlete has attended a school 
in Arizona, a high school in Arizona, and then transfers to us, they're cons- and it's their first time doing that, it's considered a first time transfer. They are required to sit out 50% of the season for any sport that they played at their previous school in the previous 12 months. So if um, you transferred here uh, and you played football at your previous high school in Arizona and now you're playing football here, you would be subject to the transfer rule in the 50% um, of the season sit period. Okay, that is a black and white rule. Um, students who have transferred more than once. So if you started at a high school, played a sport, transferred to another high school, and then have now transferred to Millennium, you would be considered um, a transfer who's transferred multiple times, and they have to sit out a full season. The 550 form is the first thing that has to be done so we can determine those next parts to see if somebody is eligible. If you have transferred to Millennium High School from out of state, students who have never attended an Arizona high school and transfer from out of state are eligible immediately with no sit period um, if they have moved uh, with or are still living with whatever parent or parents they lived with out of state, okay? Um, and again, the 550 transfer form determines that. As I go through the rosters when they're, when they're submitted to me, um, I check to see if a student athlete is a transfer student, and then we check for the 550 and so forth. If your student athlete um, does have to sit out, you will be notified um, of that as well as your student athlete. Okay, if you have questions about uh, the process um, or about being a transfer, feel free to email me or call me. I'm happy to help. Uh, communication pro- protocol. So. Uh, Throughout this season, you know, there may be some things that you have questions about or concerns about, and I want to make sure we have the proper protocol for that. If you have a question um, about uh, about something happening in the sport or a concern, uh, the correct protocol is to contact the coach via email to request a scheduled meeting for any concerns or issues. Okay, please do not approach coaches. Uh, before or after practice or before or after a game. That's not the correct protocol. At that time, they're on duty. They're required for supervising all the student athletes. They have to focus on every student athlete. Um, When you request a scheduled meeting, then that's scheduled. The coach and yourself can focus on your son or daughter and can have a conversation without distractions and everybody's locked in on what it is. Um, So those would be the that would be the protocol. Uh, if you have questions about playing time, style of play, all of those things, those are questions for the coach. Okay, um, If someone reaches out to me about playing time, reaches out to me about the style of play, philosophy, things of that nature, I'm going to redirect you to the coach um, because I'm not at every practice. I'm not at every game. Um, I can't answer those questions. They can. But more importantly than that, I would encourage you to have your student athlete first advocate for themselves and talk with their coaches um, or coach uh, to find out any answers that they have to questions. And then after that, if you're not, um, you know, you don't feel that it's been addressed or you don't feel that you you have the information you were looking for, then you can certainly uh, reach out to the coach to request a meeting. Um, I would encourage you to uh, understand this going in. Coaches are not going to talk to you about any other student athlete except your own. So they can talk to you about their student athlete, but they can't talk to you about anybody else's student athlete. Um, reasons to contact me directly would be, you know, if, um, you know, there are concerns in terms of your, your son or daughter's being discriminated against. Um, you know, there's, um, you know, hazing or things of that nature happening so that that way I can launch immediate investigation into whatever that is. Um, and I will do so if, if contacted about anything of those nature. So there'll be examples of, of times to contact me directly without going to the, the coach immediately. Okay. And, and let me also say this, um, being a high school coach is hard. Okay. Being completely honest, they do not make a lot of money to coach. They are doing that purely because they want to work with student athletes and give them a great experience and give them the opportunity to chase whatever goals and dreams there are. Um, it is hard to cut a student. It is hard to not give everybody what they want. It never comes from a place of malice. It never comes from a personal place. Our coaches are tasked with making a decision that they feel is best for the program. So our coaches have to think about three levels in some cases, two levels, one level, 
Um, some coaches have 100 and something student athletes to think of. Some have 40. But they always have more than just your child. And I can promise you, if your son or daughter playing a certain position or playing a certain amount of time was in the best interest of the program, they would do that. They're not going to, uh, you know, not play your son or daughter or not put them at a certain position um, just because. We are very lucky to have uh, some of the best coaches in the state. Um, and I'm not saying that because I work here. That's a fact. Um, they know what they're doing. They're experts at what they do. We trust them and we empower them um, and we support them. Um, so I would ask that you give you give them the same support in the same time. I would also encourage you to be careful conversations you have um, in front of your student athletes if you don't agree with something or disagree with something, because um, you know that could affect the student athlete's relationship with the coach as well as their success on the field. And what I mean by that is not retaliation because our coaches do not retaliate. But if as a parent you're telling your son or daughter do this or do that or don't do this or don't do that, but the coach is saying the opposite, now that student athlete's conflicted. Do I listen to mom and dad um, and what they say because I love them or do I listen to my coach who's trying to uh, teach, teach me educate me, make me successful in the program. And we don't want to put the student athletes in a stressful situation where they feel like they have to choose who to listen to. Again, I'm not saying you have to agree with everything that a coach does. I would encourage you to be careful in how you have those conversations with your son or daughter or what's said in front of them to not put them in a, a stressful situation. Thank you. All right, referees, officials. Um, Please let coaches communicate with the officials, okay? That is a coach's job if they have a question, if they have a concern, all right? I'll be the first to tell you that I do not agree with every call that a referee makes or an official makes. And we're not, we know right now before any game is played that we're not going to agree with some calls or we don't like some calls. That's okay. How we handle it is what we need to be careful of, okay? Um, one, there's a, sh uh, a shortage of referees in um, in Arizona and, and in the country for that matter. OK, um, so we can we can be upset. We can be mad. We cannot like a call. But what we can't do is uh, shout things at the ref, um, you know, be disrespectful towards officials or referees. I'm going to tell you right now, it's not going to help us get a better call. It's definitely not going to help overturn whatever call it is that we're upset about. Um, it is only going to, um, you know, make a situation worse. Our coaches, again, they know the protocols. They know how to communicate with officials. Um, myself, I have uh, communication lines with the head of officials if we have concerns about things, and we utilize that. So let the coaches and let myself work through officials, okay? And under no circumstances are we ever allowed, uh, or are you ever allowed to approach official, okay? Before games, after games, during a game, cannot approach an official, cannot say things to officials, cannot put their hands on officials. Um, throughout this state and throughout this country, you, you see videos regularly or you hear of situations regularly where a referee was assaulted, a referee was attacked, a referee was, was jumped. This is, even though this is high school, this is still youth sports. And we will not um, accept that behavior on our campus or even at other place, people's campuses. We don't want to get into a situation where an official um, is confronted uh, or attacked, and then we have to look at um, removing you know, your right to attend your son or daughter's games, and then you miss games. So again, don't have to agree. Don't have to like all the calls. We, we don't always either, but um, we need to handle that the right way, and that's to let the coach or myself uh, work with the officials and deal with the officials. So thank you in advance for that. Again, we're fortunate we have not had those issues, but I see the increase, the uptick, and I want to make sure that we continue to not do that uh, and and give our student athletes, um, you know, the best experience possible and protect these officials. Because if we don't have officials, we're not going to have games. That's the reality. And some officials do say, I will not go and referee certain schools. 
All right. So the next thing I want to talk about is I met with student athletes um, in the spring. So each coach had the opportunity to uh, give the names of two student athletes in their sport that they felt were leaders in that program. And I met with them to talk about what do they want to see improved at Millennium High School Athletics? What do they want to see improved at our school? And it didn't matter the sport and it didn't matter the student athlete. The overwhelming response was they wanted to see programs support other programs and students support student athlete events by attending. So they wanted to see their, their fellow student athletes that may be in another program come to their games and they wanted to do the same. Um, and as we talked through that and ways to do that, one of the things that came up was a barrier for a lot of student athletes to attend other student athlete events or for students to um, to attend events was cost, paying each game. Um, so then I brought up the student athletics pass. Uh, the overwhelming majority of them were not aware that this even existed, which that's on us as a school and myself as an athletic director. That clearly was a sign that we need to be better about promoting it. Um, but our school does have a student athletics pass. It is $25. Um, and that gets student athletes into every home game in every sport every season. So for $25, they can go to any game for this entire school year by showing their ID that it shows they have the athletics pass and they walk in and that um, and and they don't have to pay again as opposed to paying four dollars here and there and it adds up. So once you go to four or five games, the, the pass is paid paid for itself. Um, we're not doing this because we want to make money. The reality is if somebody paid every game, a student paid every game, you know, there would be more revenue. But we're doing this because we want to see our student athletes have awesome crowds, awesome spirit um, and support each other. So I would encourage everyone on here uh, to purchase an athletics pass, uh, student athletics pass for their student. Um, the students have also created a competition for the programs that um, shows the most spirit by supporting other programs, which that information will be coming out soon. We're going to meet in the next few weeks to finalize it. Uh, but again, want to encourage everybody to consider purchasing an athletic pass. We do have a goal at Millennium this year for every student athlete to purchase an athletic pass um, and for 50% uh, of our student body to purchase an athletic pass. So I hope you'll consider doing that. Um, again, this isn't about the money. This is about getting our stands full so our student athletes can play in front of a, a, a big and supportive crowd. Thank you for your consideration with that. And that can be purchased at the bookstore. Your son or daughter can go and purchase that. You can come and purchase that. And we're working on um, with District on making that an option to be able to purchase that online. All right. Next thing I want to talk about is uh, just like you guys walk into a grocery store or you go to a gas station and you see um, that the revenue, uh, I mean, that the, the cost uh, of things is higher than what it used to be. We're in the same position with the athletics. Um, you know, there's an increase in pay for game workers. There's an increase in pay for referees. Um, equipment costs more than it used to. Uh, uniforms cost more than it used to. So um, we decided that we're doing an athletic-wide fundraiser, the Tiger Open. Um, and what that is is it is a golf tournament at Top Golf um, in Glendale, there off the 101. And um, it'll be from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. on se Saturday, September 30th. Um, all of the proceeds from that, all the revenue from that um, will go to the athletic department. Every single program on our campus will benefit um, from the revenue from that because, again, it goes to paying for all the different expenses that it costs to host the game. Um, so we're asking you to consider uh, participating in that tournament, supporting that tournament to help our programs raise funds, asking you to put the word out to anybody else that you think may be interested in participating in the Tiger Open. And um, if your business or a business you work for or somebody you know may be interested in being a sponsor, um, you can have them reach out to me. We have different sponsorship packages as well. Um, you may see this um, being posted uh, soon by your, um, you know, by your booster club or by other parents or by the coach. So if you have questions on it, you can reach to me. Um, again, it's the Tiger Open presented by Arizona Staffing. Very fortunate that Arizona Staffing is being a presenting sponsor for us um, and would love to see you participate, hang out. It includes a breakfast buffet, a shirt, um, and a lot of other things. Uh, 
there. So we did top golf. So even if you're not a, a golfer, it's still an opportunity for you to come hang out, have some fun. Um, there is a tournament part for those that, that are serious about competing and other things going on. So hope that you consider um, supporting that um, and supporting all of our 29 athletic programs. I uh, wish you guys the best of luck this season. Excited to, to see you up in the stands and around. Feel free to reach out anytime. Um, my office number is 623-932-7200, uh, extension 2138, and my email, argordio at agrofree.org. All right, have an awesome school year and season, and we will see you soon.